Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. The legendary venture capitalist Alan Patrikoff is with us. His venture funds have been by any standard the most successful we've seen in the past half century. He enjoyed big scores in media, technology, and internet companies that began small and then returned to the investors' exits at huge multiples of their original capital. In his smart memoir entitled No Red Lights, he tells the story of his career, his successes, and a few failures too, with some remarkable insights into business politics and what he has found important in his life. At age 88, Alan Patrikoff is still running strong. He is fresh from his sixth New York City Marathon. I'm pleased to welcome Alan Patrikoff to the program. Thanks for having me. Well, congratulations on the marathon. You told me you are the oldest person ever to have finished the marathon. I was told that this morning. At 88, I'm the oldest person to finish the marathon. You didn't run the marathon this time. No, I walked the marathon. The yeah. other previous five times, actually four times I ran. One time I was running with a person from the Achilles Track Club, who people who have paraplegics or other uh, problems. And then this was the sixth, and this was walking. Now, at age 88, having accomplished so much in your life, why did you want to do this? Well, I actually, the idea originated last year at exactly the same time. I was watching the marathon last year, and when people walked by, I got very nostalgic about it and said, God, damn it, I want to try it again. And uh, I decided when I wrote the book this year, well, it was completed this year, I wrote it earlier, I decided I wanted to do two things this year. One was to go to Burning Man, and the other was to complete Walk, Jog, the Marathon. Now, and I did both now. Burning Man is, is what? It's a camp out west. Well, it's more than a camp. It's a uh, meeting of people, 80,000 people out in the desert for art and music, and it's very exciting, and I'm happy to say I completed that one. In what state? Nevada. Nevada. Is everybody naked? No. Some no. people are naked. Uh, a few. A few people are naked. <laughs> Not uh, me. Uh, well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> but in any event, uh, that fulfills a number of, of of nostalgic ambitions, I'm sure. So tell us uh, about your book, uh, uh, No Red Lights. You, uh, the title. I'm always intrigued with titles. Um, you say No Red Lights: Reflections on Life, 50 Years in Venture Capital, and Never Driving Alone. So you use an automobile metaphor. Exactly. The, uh, the, use an automobile metaphor, which I don't take credit for. The person who helped me in terms of putting it in shape came up with that idea. But the title was mine. I just felt that, I mean, you know, someone who goes to Burning Man at 88, 7 at that time, runs the marathon at 88, uh, walks without watching the lights, uh, uh, goes out jaywalking, uh, does whatever strikes the fancy is someone who lives a life with no red lights and I have always followed a very positive life I only know the word yes uh, I, I, I've eliminated no from my vocabulary and I try everything and so I thought that was an appropriate title and uh, the book I think conveys the life of someone who would ever pass me by that was of interest I took advantage of. And for those things that didn't pass me by, I went after it. And uh, I wanted to write this book. I wrote it for two audiences. One was for older people, if you'll forgive me, Jim, like you and myself, uh, to say to them, at age 60, uh, or whatever, however else, they, when they finished perhaps a first career, or they've been in their first career too long, to say, don't just you know drop out think about either going out and doing the same thing all over again start the same if you're in the paint business start a new paint company uh, but if you want to if you're a lawyer become a poet become a playwright uh, have travel, a tv talk show have a tv short show exactly do something interesting with your life and if you read my book one of the other things i say in there is that i'm going to live to 114 are which you I decided, gonna do that yeah i decided that I did the did Burning Man. I did the marathon. I'm going to live to 114. You know, you know just keep watching and see if I fulfill my objective. But if well, you God have, bless and lots of luck. Well, if you have that objective, when you're 60, you've only lived possibly half your life. So 
do something constructive with the second half of your life. And that's a lot of the messages that are in the book. And the second audience I wanted to interest was younger people. Uh, I have mentored tens if not hundreds of young people over the last 50 years in business. And I have watched a lot of people become very myopic in what they do. If they're in accountants, they just do spreadsheets all night. If they're lawyers, they just do briefs. Venture capitalists, they stay up all night, or investment bankers uh, were doing the same thing. And in the course of it, lots of things pass them by that they don't grab and say, I want to try this out. They, you know, and my life, I've done collected classic cars. I've done, been involved in politics, as you know. I've been invested in the theater. I've, I, I've done a lot of interesting things. And I've said to a lot of younger people, make something exciting of your life, which I think I've done with my life. So the automobile metaphor is no accident. It's personal. You collect classic cars. No, no, I think it was creative. It was very creative based on the title, No Red Lights. It was a good way to, because it was, I think, was chosen because if you're reading this book, it doesn't start at a certain date and go chronologically to the present. It goes left and right. It goes to politics. It goes to international development. It goes to whatever happened to happen in my life. And so I think the person who was helping me structure it said, uh, I wrote it, uh, said, uh, thought of it and said, you know, if you're, these are non sequiturs, it's an easy uh, metaphor to say, take a left turn or you're going, you went the wrong way. And so I think it works very effectively. Well, it does work effectively. I mean, one of the things I found fascinating about the book, and there were many things I found fascinating about it, but uh, that uh, you could have approached the whole thing chronologically. And then I did this it deal, and then I did that deal. Yeah. Very boring. Other, other books have been written like yes. that. And, uh, it's and they also talk about their, all their successes. This is about a lot of my failures. And um, as, I, as has been said of, of one book of, in that genre, uh, once you put it down, you'll never pick it up. Uh, <laughs> your book, uh, I read straight through, and, uh, part, in part because of the tone of the book, which was so personal, and I knew you, so it was you speaking to me, but I think any reader would, would gather that. And the other was that like a car, that um, uh, you zigged and you zagged and you took this turn and that turn. And uh, that was always fascinating because the reader doesn't quite know what's coming next. Is it going to be a, a multi-million dollar deal or is it going to be uh, sponsoring a, a folk singer like Oscar Brand or is it going to be owning a nightclub in the Hamptons? Uh, you're a man for all seasons. Uh, how did that happen? I think you're born that way, Jim. I don't think you, you can uh, train to have uh, a kind of, you know, forward-looking, open-minded life. I think either you are that way or you're not. And I guess I've been lucky enough to, to be that way, which enabled me to run the marathon at 88 years old, which is crazy. It really is. It's hard. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Well, so, uh, you know, the marathon is run in all five boroughs. Uh, you were born in New York? Uh, Manhattan. So you said you were born that way, but um, your father came from a different background. Uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? My father came from the Ukraine, actually about 60, 70 miles outside of Kiev. Uh, and a, I, I gave a speech in Kiev about 10, 8, 10 years ago and took a trip, side trip, uh, out to see it. And I must say it was very depressing. but. Uh, he left there in 1907 at the age of three or four as an orphan with his five brothers and sisters and uh, made it somehow to Rotterdam and on a, on a you know, uh, ship, I'm sure, in the, down in the hold and made it to the United States. And I say in the book, and I, I really meant it as I t thought about them, and after I saw the Yiddish version of Fiddler on the Roof, I couldn't help but think about, and the last scene when, when Tevye and his family, you know, are forced out of their little town, which could have easily been Smilo, where my father was from, that they got in a cart with no, with no animals, and they just pulled away. And uh, it, it really made me think about what it must have been like in 1907 to make the same kind of trip that my father did 
to get here. Well, uh, that story is uh, very typical of uh, many people, but did uh, that background inspire you to pursue the American dream the way you did in so many avenues? I honestly, you know, everyone wants to give credit to their father or mother. I, I can't give as much credit as perhaps someone else would. Uh, my father was tough. Uh, I think the only thing he contributed to me was he was bitter in a way that, you know, he grew up as an orphan and then he was poor. I guess you'd say was self-made to the extent he uh, was successful, moderately successful. He not, was not a huge success. And uh, in life, you know, he didn't build a business or become terribly wealthy. He eked out a living that was, you know, took care of his children and his family and, uh, and uh, worked till he was 94 years old. Till he was 94 years old? Yeah, yeah. Till he was forced to quit because the brokerage firm he worked for took away his desk because he didn't have enough commission business, even though I volunteered to make the commissions up, it, it didn't work. So uh, you went to uh, Ohio State, I went to Horace Mann and then Ohio State, and uh, goodbye Columbus, it's written about <laughs> Ohio State. Did you know Philip Roth? No, I did not you, know Philip Roth, but I've read his you've, books. You've read his books? I've read his books. Is that typical of Ohio State, what he writes about? Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, you know, the reason I hesitate a second is Philip Roth uh, uh, made, it, it just triggered something when they wrote his obituary. He said his favorite book was a book that happened to be one of my favorite books, which was not by him, by someone else. And uh, uh, made me think of Philip Roth, but I did not know him. Do you remember the title? Yeah, it was uh, Confessions of a Jewish, uh, a Jewish Artist. It was, about, uh, it was written by a guy named Ronald, Ronnie Kitai who was a great painter. Oh, you I, collected his paintings. I, I've collected his paintings, uh, and he has a, he was famous. He had, a, he had his moment of fame, and he's not quite as famous now as he was then, but I was really intrigued by the fact that Philip Roth thought this, was, this book was one of his favorite two books. Okay, so how did you get from uh, Goodbye Columbus to Venture? Tell us that story. Well, I started out I uh, was very lucky uh, that when I came back from uh, Columbus, Ohio in 1955, uh, there were no headhunters, there were no recruiters, they weren't looking for, you know, bright-eyed analysts, even coming out of business schools. Uh, it was just a matter of scratching around and getting a job, and certainly coming from Ohio State was not the same competing with all the Yaleys and Harvard guys like you. Uh, Princeton. Uh, uh, it's Princeton like me, but yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I, I, fit, I got Princeton <laughs> in there. Uh, 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 most of them have been my classmates at Horace Mann, by the way. Uh, and so I had to go scratch around for a job, and uh, I guess that gave me a lot of solid training. And the way you did it in those days, the way I did it, is I would walk up Wall Street because I wanted to be in the financial world. And I'd go to the top floor in an elevator and then walk down the stairway from floor to floor asking if they had any job openings. And I would start it out at whatever is 120 Wall Street and ended up getting a job at 63 Wall Street. Uh, fortunately in that building I got it in the top floor and I got it from a Yaley, uh, very unlikely guy who hired a, a Ohio State undergraduate and uh, as a security analyst. And I, uh, from there I went from one job to another, and I had four great jobs, really, really good jobs. And one of the jobs was running a family's money, which was not my family. <laughs> it was someone else's family. And I recognized that when we were running these family monies, all the family management companies, of which there were several, uh, they still exist, the Bessemer family, for Phipps family, and Ben Rock, for, uh, for uh, the Rockefellers and Whitney, uh, this family uh, all was not that different, all invested in public stocks. But every once in a while, they would take a flyer, that was an expression, take a flyer on some new startup that someone convinced them to buy, and they would put a few hundred thousand dollars in, and we did the same. But no one ever paid the attention to it. They put it in a file drawer, because everything was paper, and uh, 
no one ever looked at those companies. They only looked at IBM and General Motors, and you know, in our case, it was a lot of paper companies that were totally boring. But I was fascinated with what was what was in the in the file drawer, and included in there was an investment in New York Magazine, and I loved this what I was doing. And I said, you know, there are a lot of families around who are not paying attention to their private investments. I'm going to start a company just to service families with their private investments and bring them deals and also vet the ones that they got. And that company was Alan J. Patrickov Associates. Uh, exactly, and that, that was the firm I started with nine clients of families plus a little tiny fund of two and a half million dollars. Uh, and that firm today, which evolved as we became an international firm, uh, we added an X to APA and became APAX. And uh, today, I'm very proud, they just celebrated their 50th anniversary in the United States at MoMA, uh, the Museum of Modern Art, and, and in London, they celebrated the National Gallery, and they now manage $75 billion. Uh, $75 billion. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not part of it any longer, except... But you, you I, started it with almost nothing. Yeah, I, I got to speak at the, at, at, at the uh, two celebrations, and then I eventually left there and started as we got bigger and bigger and bigger, and I wanted to go back to the old venture world. Now, we hear a lot these days about private equity, um, really more so than venture capital. Is there a difference between venture capital and private equity? Absolutely. You know, private equity is, I'll give you one example. I stopped taking board seats in venture capital deal years ago because a venture investor has one seat out of five, one seat out of three, one seat out of seven. A private equity has control of the board. So that's a major indication. Private equity are people who go into later stage deals. They usually are financed with some debt. And uh, the private equity person has a large, large say in what happens. A venture capitalist is an early stage deal, pre-seed, seed, startup, and uh, contribute to the growth but in relatively smaller amounts of dollars. And it's, it's probably the more exciting end. I mean, you know many of the companies I was involved with, like Apple and AOL and Audible, were early virtually startups. They, weren't, they were venture deals, but eventually became private equity deals and became public companies. Now, uh, what's so nice about your book is uh, you modestly talk about uh, some of the losers, uh, or at least the opportunities that uh, uh, you passed on, like Starbucks, uh, like Uber, uh, maybe some others. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Why did you turn down Starbucks? And no, you know, it, in hindsight, it looks it's strange, but it, <laughs> it, it's not that strange, really. Uh, uh, someone, I had a West Coast office at that time, and one young guy who was a counterculture person, I have to throw that in because he wasn't a traditionalist, and, you know, uh, what looked like counterculture, by the way, then is today, you know, the, nor the norm. The mainstream. Yeah. Uh, but he said, he came up one day and did this analysis and found these two coffee shops up in Seattle and said, I think these guys have got an interesting business. And I said, are you kidding? We've got two coffee shops on every street mm. in Manhattan. Why in the world do we need to be as a venture investor in a in a chain of coffee shops. Well, I didn't understand. Maybe if I'd gone out there, I would have understood. It wasn't really a coffee shop like the ones we had here. It was really a, a way of living. It was a, you know, where people would hang around. I mean, coffee shops here, you went in for five minutes on a stool, got your coffee and left. I mean, totally different from what 